by phone. Please mute yourself if you're not speaking and please avoid putting the meeting on hold. If you must leave, it's better to hang up and rejoin the meeting. And for my MAC members, um, I'm gonna ask that you use the raise hand button if you have a comment or a question or else put a note in the chat. Um, so the Medicaid Advisory Committee has built in time for discussion after each presentation. We're gonna ask MAC members to speak first. Um, when we've exhausted all the questions and comments from MAC members, if there's any time remaining on the agenda for the agenda item, we will take general questions. And um, I want to note that we have 10 minutes for public comment near the end of the meeting. Um, we have ASL and Spanish language interpretation available for today's meeting. You can pin the ASL interpreters video uh, by clicking on the more button next to their name. Um, and there's also a button for interpretation, which is where you'll find the Spanish language interpretation at the bottom of your Zoom screens. And um, I uh, want to let you know that MAC co-chair Heather Jeffress is unable to join us today. Um, she's fine, if, if anybody's concerned. Um, but anyway, two of our members, thankfully, Dr. Uh, Caroline Barrett and Kelly DeVore, have graciously agreed to facilitate today's meeting. Um, Caroline is going to take us through the first half of our meeting before I hand it off. I will also note that we're going to hold off on introducing the consent agenda that's listed on your agendas until Heather returns. So with all of that, uh, we'll turn it over to Caroline. Good morning. Welcome committee members and members of the public. Let's start roll call. So I am here, um, Awab al Rawe. Awab, are you here? Okay, we can come back to Awab. Uh, Gabe Triplett is an excused absence. Heather Jeffress is an excused absence. Hillary Thompson. Good morning, I am here. Jerry Weeks. I'm sorry, Andrea, I think you're, you might not be on mute. Okay, um, Jerry Weeks, are you here this morning? Yes, I am. Thank you. Kaya Adams? Kaya, are you here this morning? Okay, Kelly DeVore. Good morning, here. Laura McKean. I'm here. Lisa Pearson. Here. Ronnie St. John. Present, good morning. Shannon Buck is an excused absence. Dr. Tony German. Good morning, present. And Peter Starkey. Good morning, present as well. Thank you, and I'll circle back. Um, Awab, have you joined us? Or Kaya. So, yeah, Sarah, if you could help me determine if we have a quorum. I'm counting one, two. We do. We, we do. do. Have Wonderful. We have a quorum. Okay. Um, Thank you. Yeah, so, you we'll make ahead. note of if um, we see Kaya or Awab join, we'll make note of that. Wonderful. Thank you. You may have noticed a couple of changes in roll call today. Regretfully, DJ Rhodes has stepped down from the MAC. We have begun the process of recruiting a new representative from County Public Health to replace him. If you know a good candidate, please send them our way. I am happy to welcome Laura McKean as a new member with oral health expertise. Laura, would you like to introduce yourself and say a few words about why you joined the MAC? Sure, thank you, Caroline. Um, good morning, everyone. Good morning, MAC members. Um, my name is Laura McKean, and I am the Senior Director of Oral Health Services and Community Engagement with All Care, CCO, and we serve Jackson, Josephine, Curry, and Southern Douglas counties. And my job at All Care is to manage the dental benefit for our Medicaid members and make sure that the Medicaid members are getting the dental services that they need. Um, I have always um, 
loved listening into the MAC meetings. I've been with All Care 10 years. Um, so I've been uh, been here quite a while. Um, this is probably of the committees that report to the Oregon Health Policy Board. This is probably um, my favorite committee because it really um, involves um, Medicaid members in giving a lot of voice to the Medicaid uh, benefit that Oregon has. So happy to be here. Um, thank you for having me. Thank you, Laura. I grew up in Curry County, so thanks for doing that work in rural Oregon. Oh. Committee members, last week you received draft minutes to review. Please take a moment to review them for any errors or omissions. Do any members have concerns about the minutes? If there are no revisions, do I have a motion to approve the February regular meeting minutes? This is Kelly, I will move approval. Thank you, do I have a second? This is Gary Weeks, I'll second. Thank you, any objections? Any abstentions? The motion carries. So moving to our first presentation, a legislative update. We are joined by many members of OHA's legislative team to update us on significant legislation affecting OHA. They will highlight bills that affect Medicaid, OHP, HOP recipients. I believe we have with us today, Oregon Health Authority Chief of Staff, Ashley Thurstup, OHA Director of Government Relations, Phil Schmidt, OHA Senior Policy Advisors, Matthew Green, John English, Robert Lee, and M. Drogue, and Legislative Analyst, Mary Beth Milu. Who would like to start? So I will start, I'm Matthew Green. Unfortunately, Ashley and Phil were not able to make it today, so they send their regrets. We tweaked our presentation a little bit after we sent it to you, mostly to make it a little bit shorter to fit in the time we have. So if you're willing uh, to drop this slideshow and I can bring up the slideshow and run it from my end, just because it's a little shorter, save us a little bit of time. Is that reasonable? Yes, thank you. Okay. I can't do it until somebody pulls this one down. I gotcha, I'm coming out right now. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thanks. although it's largely the same presentation. So we are going to run through just a few of the bills that passed the session. It was for a short session, a pretty busy one regarding health issues and uh, Medicaid issues in particular. Um, obviously some, some big things that got into the media quite a bit, but we are only gonna have time here to, to mention a few of them. We do wanna point you to some information on the OHA webpage, the government relations page on the, the main OHA site that has much more detailed information about all of the bills affecting health. So you can go there, you can also find more, kind of our longer version of this presentation if you're interested. So there's a lot more detail there. I think somebody else is gonna post that into the chat. Um, I, as, as I mentioned, there was a lot of bills and there was a lot of investment actually in both housing and behavioral health, both of which are uh, priorities of the governor, and in some cases, kind of interacting across these two things. Um, we're going to go into a little bit more details of some of those as we go through here. To start with, the behavioral health group of, of bills, the one that got the most media attention was clearly House Bill 4002. And this was described in the media as repealing Measure 110. And that's partly true and partly not true. On the criminal justice side, it was true. They returned possession of small amounts of controlled substances back to a misdemeanor that it had been before Measure 110. On the health side, they really didn't change it. The behavioral health resource networks, the burns, continue to exist, continue to do the work they do, continue to receive most, not all, most of the money that they had prior. And on the health side, they added quite a few uh, individual or new health efforts or enhanced various efforts, including expanding certified community behavioral health clinics statewide, sort of behavioral health safety net clinics, funding for SUD treatment in jails, and a bunch of other things. 
the funding for all of these items came in House Bill 5204. It's about $221 million for these, some of which were operated through OHA, but a lot of them did not. So it, it's a big, complicated bill. In fact, on 4002 and 5204, we have a fact sheet on our website that's specifically about those bills. So moving on, because we're going to save some time, I'm going to hand this over to Robert. Good, afternoon. Good morning, everyone. My name is Robert Lee. Uh, I serve as one of the policy advisors here in government relations. My portfolio is behavioral health and tribal health. Um, and one of the other bills regarding behavioral health and addiction crises that, that was fairly uh, prolific this session was House Bill 4092 related to community mental health program costs and administrative burden studies. Uh, this bill directs OHA to complete two studies related to behavioral health systems. The first one requires OHA to con consult with counties and community mental health programs, or CMHPs, to determine necessary funding to perform all the behavioral health services that are required of them under state laws. The second study under contract with Oregon Council for Behavioral Health will be evaluating existing statutes, administrative rules, contract language related to local behavioral health programs, identifying redundancies or contradictions and make recommendations to the legislature to reduce administrative burden on those programs. Um, I think we can go to the next slide uh, where we're, we can talk a little bit about the behavioral health uh, bills that were passed regarding youth and children. Uh, probably the biggest one was Senate Bill 1557. If anyone was in the Capitol building and hearing the term culture of yes, this is the bill that that's related to. Uh, overall, it's generally uh, related to home and community-based services for youth under 21. Uh, the, the provisions of this bill are to improve home and community-based wraparound services to the children and youth that are under 21 with disabilities and chronic illnesses. Directs OH. With the tree? I believe somebody is not muted. If everyone yep. can check their mute, please. But I always appreciate treats as well. And, and so do my dogs here at home. Um, so uh, this bill, 1557, it directs OHA and uh, ODHS, our partner department, to pursue federal funds to provide youth who have complex health needs with access to medically appropriate care, including behavioral health care at home and in the community. Disregards parental income for services for those children and youth who meet eligibility requirements. Clarifies orders directing youth who receive restorative services does not commit the youth to the custody of OHA or alter their guardianship. It also prohibits the denial of mental health assessment, treatment, or services to individuals on the basis that the individuals may have intellectual or developmental disabilities. One of the other bills that we thought might be of interest for some here was House Bill 4151, which directs the System of Care Advisory Council, also known as SOCAC, uh, to develop a Youth Behavioral Health Workforce Subcommittee. This subcommittee will be identifying state-issued professional authorization options, such as licensure for the behavioral health workforce, identifying existing and emergency professions, um, and also identify strategies for creating pathways into the, the behavioral health profession specific to youth, and they will be reporting back to the legislature. With that, we can move on to the next slide. And I think Matthew has this one. This one's me, Robert. Thank oh, you. Paul. Perfect. Hi, everyone. I'm M. Drogi. I use she and they pronouns. I am a member of the GR team who focuses on public health and equity and inclusion, and I'm going to speak to Senate Bill 1506. COVID tests this is to test for COVID and provide COVID treatment, including drug therapy for Oregon Health Plan members. And as you all are probably aware, these services are already covered by OHP, but this makes it so that folks can access them without requiring a physician to hopefully increase the availability of tests and treatment through local pharmacies. And we can go ahead and go to the next slide. which is all about public health. And I will speak to one of these. We're gonna be talking about House Bill 4081, Emergency Medical Services Modernization. This bill creates the Emergency Medical Services Advisory Board. 
the board will develop a comprehensive modernized statewide emergency medical services system administered by OHA. And this modernized system will hopefully provide better services to people throughout the state with fewer disparities in treatment of time sensitive medical emergencies. And I will pass it over to John to cover the next two. Thank you, Em. Hi, everyone. John English, also a member of the government relations team, he, him. Uh, Senate Bill 1529 and 1530 are somewhat related. Senate Bill 1529 continues the state program that was started under Senate Bill 1536 in 2022. And importantly, this bill allows for OHA to provide air conditioners, air filtration systems uh, to individuals who need them in advance of a formal declaration of emergency. So, this is important because it allows us to get these devices to people who are not eligible to do the 11 15 demonstration waiver, which is many you know, also provides these devices to these health related social section. So, this will be a really important uh, a effort that allows us to get these devices out in a preventive, proactive way. Senate Bill 1530 is omnibus funding bill that creates the money flow to support this program. Uh, in addition to the air filtration and air conditioning program, it provides $18 million for 12 community partners to provide recovery housing, $15 million for the Healthy Homes Repair Fund, and the $3.5 million is specifically for the air conditioners and air filtration systems that I mentioned. That, I believe the baton goes over to, to back to you, Em. Thanks, John. So there were a few bills this session that touched on licensing and health professionals, and I'm going to speak to Senate Bill 1578, which requires OHA to establish and administer a healthcare interpreter management system for scheduling and billing of healthcare interpreters who serve Oregon Health Plan members. It also establishes a recruitment and training program for healthcare interpreters through a nonprofit, and this bill will hopefully make it easier for non-English speaking Oregon Health Plan members to access healthcare interpreters. And I will pass it over to Robert. Great, thank you, Em. Uh, one of the other bills that we thought was notable, Senate Bill 1521, an omnibus measure related to enhanced supports for employers of personal support workers, makes several changes related to care for vulnerable individuals requires ODHS to contract with at least one organization to provide enhanced supports to employers of personal support workers and describes the supports that must be provided by the organization. It also requires OHA to hire one position for Medicaid program integrity and enforcement actions and further establishes compliance standards to mitigate Medicaid fraud, offers additional supports related to personal support workers provided in or providing in-home services using agency with choice practices where a person-centered approach to ensuring the person being cared for is at the center of the decision-making process. It also extends timeline requirements for residential adult foster home automatic sprinkler systems. It pushes that, that timeline requirement out about one more year. Um, and I believe the next bill is one of John's. Thanks, Robert. House Bill 4129 in-home care service providers. Um, many of you likely know that in Oregon, individuals who receive home and community-based services reports can do so under one of two models. They can either um, delegate entirely to a home care agency as the employer, or they can function as the employer themselves. But what this bill does essentially is it creates a third hybrid model where the individual can retain a lot of the hiring, training, and management aspects with regard to home care workers, but will still allow the home care agency to manage a lot of the administrative duties like payroll and benefits and those kinds of things. Uh, so this bill specifies requirements around that, talks about client rights, employment conditions, it articulates reimbursement structures, contract, contract provisions, and it requires the Oregon Department of Human Services and OHA to adopt rules that contract with up to two agencies to provide this new model of service by January 1 of 2026. That, I think it goes back to Mary Beth, am I right? Yep, that's me. Hi everyone, Mary Beth Milieu. I use she and her pronouns. 
Um, and I am a senior policy advisor on the government relations team that focuses on health policy and analytics as well as PEB and OEB. The bill I'm going to be talking to you all about today is Senate Bill 1508. Um, and, you know, it's notoriously complex and a little confusing for people to understand. But essentially what this bill does is direct the Health Evidence Review Commission and the Pharmacy and Therapeutics Committee to eliminate the use of something we call quality of life, quality adjusted life years, excuse me, or qualies for short. Um, this tool, uh, qualies, has widely been seen as discriminatory towards people with disabilities or chronic conditions. Um, so the use of this will be eliminated when it comes to making decisions around what medical treatments or medis medications are covered by OHP. This bill also puts a cap on insulin out-of-pocket costs. So that cap would be $35 a month uh, for a one-month supply or $95 for a three-month supply. And I think it goes to Matthew for a wrap-up. So that was a whirlwind tour through the bills from this session. And as I mentioned on the web, web page for government relations at OHA, which I see finally, we got the right one finally in there. There is a lot more detail about all of these bills. So we are perfectly happy to take questions either now, or if you want to send them to us later, this is our contact information. It's also on that web page, So you don't have to memorize this right at this moment. But so we would be happy to take any questions that you have. As I said, we can stick around for a few minutes if there's something specific to talk about or get back to you if you think of a question later in this meeting. Thank you for um, all of those updates. I did have a couple of questions myself. I work as a family practice physician. And for uh, 4012 and 4113, I was curious what were the some of the broad overview of the clinician administrator drugs and then the pharmacy costs of the copay accumulator. What are you able to speak to those at all? Mary Beth, you want to jump on this? Yeah, okay. Yeah, I can do my best. Those um were overseen by somebody else on our team, but I can uh do my best. So um let's see. 4012. So can you um, repeat your question about the co the copay accumulator bill? Just what, what do those bills entail? Oh, sure. Yeah, absolutely. So for 4012, it clarifies and ensures that doctors who want to administer like um, cancer drugs can do it in the setting that's best for their patient. Um, so it changes the insurance code to allow for various settings, which is a positive thing for Oregonians because Oregonians go undergoing clinician administered drug treatment can now be in the setting that their doctor believes is the best. And then for 4113, that bill limits the practice of coupon values not applying to your copay. So now coupon values will apply to a patient's out-of-pocket expenses and co-pays and allow folks to reach their deductible annual limits faster, um, which is great. And then for the, let's see, 4113, that was a copay accumulator bill. Oh, wonderful. Thank you. Okay, that great. answers my question. Do we have other questions or comments from committee members? We have about five minutes for more questions. Dr. German. Yeah, thank you all. Um, uh, this is a good refresher. I know we just went over this on o o OHPV. I, I want to draw back. Uh, I haven't had um, looked at this further, but with SB 1529 and SB 1530, could you clarify, does the um, dispensing of those air filtration and filters um, uh, with climate-related, um, um, health-related um, uh, resources, is the emergency declaration have to be made or is the idea that we're stepping outside of the emergency declaration? Yeah, I, I'm happy to take this one. Uh, the latter. So one of the things that we ran into with CMS, the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services, with the waiver was 
hey, we want to provide these devices to folks who need them. And we were told, no, you can't do it unless and until you have a federal or state level formal declaration of climate emergency. And so that sort of shrunk the population that we were able to provide these devices to under the waiver. So what the state program does importantly is it says, uh, and we worked to get this language specifically into the bill itself, it says you can provide these devices in advance. If there's someone who is uh, medically at risk and we know there are wildfires coming or we know that there's a heat dome event that's supposed to be happening, we don't have to wait for any kind of formal declaration. We're allowed to get those devices out. That answer the question? It does. That's really great news. Um, is that um, undergoing rules making or is that delegated to the CCOs to um, um, state how that would be um, dispensed? I think the beauty of this is that it's a continuation of an already existing state program. So a lot of the infrastructure has been set up. We have an in-house a group of folks that are working on that. So right now there are some interagency meetings happening together to sort of figure out the procurement. But I think the infrastructure in terms of using community partners to distribute these devices is already in place. I don't know for sure if there are any tweaks that would need to be made to existing rules. I can double check on that. But I think by and large, most of the stuff is already set up to make this happen fairly. Excellent. Thank you, John. You bet. We have time for one or two more questions. Okay, well, if we don't have any more questions, um, many thanks to the legislative team for joining us. And please feel free to reach out to them with any additional questions. Thank you for your time thank today. You. Thank you so much. It's a lot. So we will now hear from our Oregon Health Authority and Oregon Department of Human Services staff representatives about updates on policy and operations in their agencies that affect delivery of Medicaid services. Hillary and Awab, are you ready to present? I am ready to present. I believe that uh, Awab is out today. So I will be yeah. here talking about um, ODHS updates. Uh, so good morning. My name is Hillary Thompson. Um, my pronouns are she, her, hers. I am a white woman with uh, curly reddish brown hair that I wear up in a bun and I'm wearing dark frame glasses. My uh, background is blurred, but I do work at home. So you can see some outline of my blurry home office behind me. Um, so real quickly today, we wanted to talk about um, some of the work that our eligibility staff has done in March. Um, SNAP renewal waiver ending uh, in May of 2024, which is going to have impacts on our eligibility workload as we continue the public health emergency unwinding. And then um, wanted to highlight and uh, present some information about very recent uh, rule changes from the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, or CMS, um, regarding streamlining Medicaid, CHIP, and basic health plan eligibility, enrollment, and renewals. And next slide, please. So I think as we talk about um, elig Medicaid eligibility and, and operations, I think it's really important to put that into context of the amount of work that our eligibility staff is doing every month. So in March of 2024, our eligibility workers completed, and this is just at the um, at the One Customer Service Center, uh, 50,177 phone calls um, with an average wait time of about six minutes, which I think is pretty good. We completed 28,185 appointments those appointments could be um, somebody who is applying for benefits for the first time and maybe they need to complete an interview or they're renewing benefits and they need to complete an interview or it could just be somebody who prefers to do the application with an eligibility worker in real time. Uh, we processed 54,362 applications. About 13,000 of those were done in person, uh, pretty close, same amount on the phone. Um, or received on the phone. 
And then about 16,900 applications were received using our uh, one online portal. We got about 1,600 referrals from the federally, federally facilitated marketplace, that's the FFM. And then um, about 8,837 applications that were received um, and processed from other sources like mail or drop boxes at the local office or maybe fax or email. And next slide, please. So in um, July of last year, um, Oregon requested a federal waiver from the USDA Food and Nutrition Services or FNS to complete SNAP renewals using the periodic report process. Um, that waiver was approved uh, to be able to use from July of 2023 to May of 2024. And that specifically to was asked for and done to help support the public health emergency unwinding workload to allow our eligibility staff more time to focus on medical renewals um, and uh, streamline and simplify the process for um, SNAP, uh, SNAP renewals. So periodic reports are normally used for SNAP during a mid-certification reporting that's required every six months of the certification period. So in a 12-month certification, for example, they're due in month six, and then for a 24-month certification period, they're due in months five, 11, and 17. The actual processing of periodic reports is a shortened process because not all eligibility factors need to be reviewed and there's also no interview requirement. So this not only saved uh, time on processing for our eligibility staff, it also really helped to clear the statewide scheduling board to ensure that timely appointments times were available for folks who actually needed to complete an interview as a part of their medical intake or renewal or again, who chose to complete their medical application or renewal with an eligibility worker. This also made it a lot easier on the people who were renewing their SNAP because uh, they didn't need to provide as much proof of information or do, during, do an interview to complete that renewal. So for example, uh, periodic reports only require that a few eligibility factors are actually reviewed such as um, any changes in their household composition, the people who live in their household or who are applying for benefits with them, um, any shelter your changes in shelter and utility costs, but only if there was a recent move, um, changes in income of more than $125, or if anybody with um, an ABOD or uh, able adult without dependents, able-bodied adult without dependents, excuse me, um, who are now working less than 20 hours a week. So they um, have, a, have a work requirement to maintain eligibility for SNAP. Um, or if there was any changes to court-ordered support, child support. Um, so pretty minimal uh, eligibility factors that actually need to be reviewed and, and verified during that periodic report process. With the end of that waiver, um, that again is in May of 2024, so next month, we have to revert back to the um, the original uh, SNAP renewal process, which does require a full application and interview. Um, and this is going to mean more time consuming SNAP renewals for eligibility staff, less appointment availability for people who are needing, are needing medical appointments as we continue to work through the public health emergency unwinding. So really, again, wanted to put this into context as we continue to work through the, the unwinding period. And next slide, please. So at the end of March, uh, CMS, which is again, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, released part two of rule changes Part one um, that was about Medicare Savings Program or MSP eligibility and enrollment was changed in November of 2023. And then they just released uh, part two. Please note that these rule changes are separate from the rule changes that have been uh, previously discussed at this meeting that are specific to this committee's role and responsibilities. 
these, these rule changes are really about um, Medicaid enrollment and application processes. The overall goal of these rule changes is to streamline and align MAGI and non-MAGI eligibility rules and processes to reduce barriers to enrollment and end burdensome requirements. The good news is that we already do a lot of what is uh, being established in these rule changes. For example, we provide at least 15 days to respond to a request for information, and we have a 90-day reconsideration period when medical coverage ends due to the person's failure to respond to a renewal. And those things apply to both MAGI and non-MAGI programs. But there are some changes that we're going to need to make and the ODHS Aging and People with Disabilities or APD uh, Medicaid Financial Eligibility Policy Team is working very closely with the OHA Medicaid Eligibility Policy Team to collaborate on these rule changes including plans to hold joint rules advisory committing, committee meetings and um, updating our integrated one system to accommodate these changes. Next slide, please. So a couple of highlights. Um, a big one for non-MAGI programs is the prohibition of requiring in-person interviews, which the rule continues on to say also includes interviews completed over the phone and virtually using things like Zoom. There's some language in the final rule that makes the, this interpretation unclear, whether it's a prohibition of interviews using any format or specifically in person or over the phone or virtually. Um, so we will be following up with CMS to get clarity on this rule before implementing any rule or system changes. Eliminating the interview requirement does have some pros and cons. Um, interviews are used as an opportunity to clarify information that's been reported on an application or any verifications that have been submitted, provide choice counseling, and also to answer any questions the person may have about how to use their benefits, um, what their benefits include. Uh, less medical interviews will also mean there is more appointment availability on our statewide scheduling board for people who choose to complete an application with an eligibility worker. And for um, other programs that will still have an interview requirement like SNAP. Another rule change is to clarify that reasonable compatibility policies we currently only use for income also apply to resources that are verified electronically through the Asset Verification System or AVS. Reasonable compatibility is basically running case information through trusted federal data sources to electronically verify financial information. If the results of that electronic check are within a certain range of what's been reported on the application, we consider that information reasonably compatible and we do not require the person to submit proof. For resources under current practices, if AVS results in an undisclosed asset, so we the AVS system finds maybe a bank account that wasn't originally reported, uh, we are currently pending the medical case and asking the person to provide proof of that asset. Under this rule change, if the undisclosed asset does not impact eligibility, we would consider it reasonably compatible and not ask for that verification. So for example, if AVS returns an undisclosed asset with a value of $800, but the total resources on the case are still less than 2,000, we would consider the resources reasonably compatible and move forward with the eligibility determination. Pursuing assets is another big change to the rule. Um, I wanted to quickly note here that Oregon has not required people who are eligible to enroll in Medicare to pursue Medicare enrollment since 2022, but this rule change expands that policy to other benefits like SSA income, uh, pensions, veteran benefits, unemployment compensation, and um, employer-sponsored health coverage. This rule was change was made to reduce the burden on applicants to pursue other assets and benefits for Medicaid eligibility. I'm sure you know, applying for SSA income, VA benefits, et cetera, can be time consuming, confusing and burdensome, especially for our uh, older adults and people with living, living with disabilities or blindness. 
Uh, that last one there um, about the 90 day reconsideration period. So we currently have a 90 day reconsideration period during which a person whose coverage ended because they did not respond to a renewal can reapply without a gap in coverage if they're found eligible uh, 90 days after their medical benefits closed. Um, this rule change expands that policy to new applications, not just renewals. So for example, if Medicaid is denied due to failure to provide proof of information that was requested at initial application or intake, that person will have 90 days to submit that information and have their eligibility redetermined where we could potentially honor their uh, original date of request. And next slide, please. So the Medicare Savings Program and Low Income Subsidy Alignment, this was um, part one of the CMS rule changes that were released in November of 2023. Um, people apply for low income subsidy, also known as extra help through the Social Admi uh, Security Administration. If the person is ineligible for LIS, uh, Social Security sends data to state Medicaid agencies like ODHS and OHA, which we receive through uh, an interface with the um, between Social Security and our integrated one system. Currently, the LAS referral from Social Security establishes a date of request for medical, but we still require an application signature and an interview. With this rule change, we need to start using information received from Social Security to determine eligibility for Medicare savings programs without requiring a new application. So again, this is really just to streamline eligibility processes and reduce the burden to the applicant. With the requirement to use LAS data as an application for Medicare savings programs, CMS is prohibiting states from collecting information needed for eligi uh, MSP eligibility unless we have information that is not reasonable, reasonably compatible with the information that we got from Social Security. So for example, um, if we run our income through the income through trusted federal data sources and compare that income to the reasonable compatibility standards, uh, if the information we get, we find during that process isn't reasonably compatible with the information we receive from SSA, uh, as part of that LAS referral, we could we could request proof of income from the applicant. If it is reasonably compatible, then we would not. CMS is also strongly encouraging states to align LAS and uh, Medicare savings program income and resource methodologies, basically how specific types of income and resources are counted or excluded. This is somewhat simplified in Oregon because we removed the resource limits for uh, Medicare savings program eligibility in 2016, but we still need to evaluate um, alignment of, of specific income types. And the compliance for this, um, oh, excuse me. Um, I did wanna call out quickly that the compliance dates for all of these rule changes vary. Um, I'm happy to drop a few links in chat that um, will uh, will help go over these dates. Um, as I think I said before, we are still doing uh, some analysis on what this means for Oregon and working very closely with our OHA partners to make sure that uh, we are aligning programs as much as possible so that we can be in, in compliance with these rules. These rules are not only going to take um, probably some Oregon administrative rule updates, but we will also need to update our integrated one system, um, which takes time. <laughs> and I think that's about it for me. Um, were there any questions? I know this is a dense information. Thank you. I appreciate the information on streamlining the process, particularly with the income verification. That seems like a really positive move. Uh, do any uh, committee members have questions or comments for Hillary? Tony. Hey, Hillary, thank you for that presentation. Um, 
trying to formulate my my question. Part of it is um, drawing back to the SNAP benefits and some of the programs that we know applications can be quite burdensome, and we know the merits of those, and we are dependent on the the, um, the workflows and processes from a federal standpoint. I'm just curious um, if discussions, and I'd be curious to offer to the, the group of OHA as well. Um, I know there's some work in New York and um, some 1115 waivers trying to simplify the application process, a couple of different programs and thinking of a hub um, a, in a process um, that we can, um, you know, this information is rather um, consistent across several different uh, applications, whether that's TANF or SNAP or WIC or things of that nature, uh, and the benefits of those programs um, are, are, are great. Are there thoughts or, you know, uh, this is a more loftier question, how do we uh, create uh, changes uh, as far as rulemaking in our own state and, and where that might take place? And if that's an IT concern, you know, thinking of something like high talk um, and how we might modify that. But it, it does draw a concern for me that we're making it more burdensome and setting up more barriers to SNAP benefits. And, and, and certainly I know in my patients, um, this is very valuable as far as addressing food scarcity. Um, uh, and um, so uh, I don't have a real well formulated question is more uh, the sense of drawing back. Do you think there are tools that we can engage coming out of the this uh, emergency declaration that we learn from uh, those and how can we simplify this process across these different applications? Sure. Um, I think that is a lofty question, but I think it's a great one. Um, I think one of the there, I think one of the benefits of using um, the integrated one system as our um, eligibility determination software is that it does determine eligibility for all programs, Medicaid, SNAP, TANF, child care. Um, and so information that's reported for one program can be used across programs. So for example, if I need to verify my income for SNAP, um, medical programs can also use that income as uh, verified income in their in their eligibility determination. Um, so I think that's a, a bonus. Um, I think one like specific to Medicaid and Medicaid enrollment in our Medicaid application, one of the things that I hear a lot is that, um, the the methodologies specifically between um, MAGI and non-MAGI programs are very different. And the way that the integrated one system works is it uh, reviews the person for any and all medical programs, MAGI and non-MAGI included, they could possibly be eligible for. And so what we end up doing is we end up collecting a lot of information up front. Um, we should only be pending for information and requesting proof of information from the person if it's actually needed for the the medical program that the system kind of lands on is like okay so we've reviewed you for everything you you might be eligible for this program but we need some more information um i think one of the nice things about the msp and low income subsidy alignment project is that um ideally when we receive a, an LAS referral from Social Security, we can run them through the system as only an, an MSP application, um, which means that we wouldn't need your resource information, for example. So we wouldn't even look at that, wouldn't request it. Um, at the same time, if that person is potentially eligible for full Medicaid, right, full OHP, we want to be able to evaluate them for that as well without creating um, burdensome processes or, or barriers. So I think it's a complicated <laughs> uh, issue. Um, and it, I know that it is definitely um, forefront and discussed a lot internally within um, 
the I work very closely with the OHA Medicaid eligibility policy team. Um, and uh, I know it's discussed very much within that team as well as my own um, ODHS APD team and leadership. So I don't know if that answers your question, but um, we are definitely talking about it continually and, and trying to identify uh, especially systematic solutions, yeah. You gave a terrific response for a terribly worded question in the first place. So I, I might reach out to you. I would be interested in, in learning more, uh, 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 being naive to the full capacity of the integrated one system. I, I feel like I'd like to learn more. So I might just shoot you a message on the side. Yeah, absolutely. Please do. Other questions or comments from any committee members? I'm just going to interject and ask um, folks on the Mac if the one system is something um, that we'd like to learn more about generally. I don't think we have to answer that question now, but um, put a bug in folks' ear. That's something we ought to put on a future agenda. Sarah, I think that's a great question. And, you know, Tony uh, is interested as well. I think I would definitely benefit from learning more about that. And we've got a thumbs up from Tony. Would yep. other people find that interesting? Yes. Well, I think you have your answer, Sarah. It sounds like we would all be interested in that. So thanks for bringing that up as a possible future presentation. Other, were we still have a little time. Are there other comments or questions for Hillary? Or Hillary, do you have any other parting wisdom that you feel like we should think about? A parting wisdom, no. <laughs> <laughs> or uh, pearls, <laughs> things that you right? wish you could share with us. Um, I think, I mean, we're we're very working very hard and doing a lot of planning around um, the public health emergency unwinding as we continue to gear up for that. We need to be completely done with our renewals by February of 2025. Um, so we've been discussing um, outreach opportunities specifically to our long-term care population who may have a harder time completing those renewals. Um, you know, working with our case managers, community partners, et cetera. Um, so I think that's uh, that's where our, I think a lot of our focus is. I don't know if that's parting wisdom, but, <laughs> um, you know, think good thoughts. <laughs> I think we all appreciate the work that you and your team are doing to try to help make this process as smooth as possible and keep benefits for as many members as possible. Well, if there aren't any additional questions, we are not, uh, we can, I guess, move on to our next topic. So thank you, Hillary. So at this time, we are going to have a brief discussion on what comprises official duties for MAC members. I'll ask Sarah to share a brief presentation, and I want to spend most of our time here building consensus about what we consider official duties for members of the MAC. We may decide to vote on this definition if we have a clear consensus. If not, we can defer for future discussion. Sarah did send out a follow-up email yesterday with the uh, DAS guidance on this process um, of what some other guidelines from um, about official duties. I'm just trying to find that in my own email. Uh, but so you should have that in your email from yesterday at 4.08 p.m. All right, Sarah. And my apologies for that, folks. Somehow we left it off of our um, email before. Um, and I, uh, in any case, um, we are going to chat uh, because one of the things that was in the document from the Department of Administrative Services was um, a best practice that they suggested, which is that we have a conversation about official duties um, on our boards. And so I'll go into that. Let's go to the next slide, 
I'm getting a little out of order here, trying to be a little more linear. So just as a reminder for folks, in 2021, the legislature passed legislation that provides um, per diem compensation, and that's tied, that amount is tied to the same amount that legislators get as a per diem. So eligibility, and this and this is, you know, for anybody on a, a board or a commission, there's, there's some parameters around that, but the MAC clearly falls into those parameters. So anybody who meets the eligibility requirement um, who's on the MAC or on its subcommittee um, can receive that compensation. Um, and I will just say, I think um, anybody who's been involved with that compensation process would agree that we've had some struggles implementing that process, but we're getting it down. So the next uh, slide, please. Um, and recently to help us get it down, um, we have received uh, final gui finalized guidance from the Department of Administrative Services. That's what came in your email yesterday. Um, and again, they had a key recommendation in there this is, um, to have this conversation. So this is kind of the first opportunity that we've had to put this on the agenda. Um, and so we wanted to, to talk with you all about what official duties for the Medicaid Advisory Group uh, Committee look like. So um, we'll go to the next slide. And I want to stay really focused on um, this because um, there's lots of issues that we've had with the compensation. There are lots of issues around, you know, what this does for people's benefits if they receive the compensation. There are issues of, about taxation. There are lots of other kind of issues around the compensation, but I really want to stay focused um, on the duties for MAC members. I will make one note. Um, there are examples in the document from um, DAS that um, talk about de minimis work, like reading emails. Um, and we ought, we know that there's the possibility um, that people are differently abled and maybe reading an email takes more time than five to 10 minutes, right? And it's really, um, um, a more time consuming process. And for that, we have um, an HR process essentially um, to work with people on a one-to-one -one basis. So having said that, I wanna set out um, what the duties for MAC members are generally, what meetings count, what tasks count, and um, are there other things that I am not thinking about that fall into those two categories? that we would want to spell out. So I, I hope that makes sense. Um, and I'm going to ask, uh, again, Caroline to kind of facilitate the conversation. Um, but that's the, that's what we're, we're after. So just to make, thank you, Sarah, just to make sure I understand our goal today is to at least, well, if we can come to a consensus, but at the very uh, start the conversation about what we are defining as official duties that are eligible for compensation. Is that accurate? That's correct. Okay. So based on the questions Sarah has posted of what meetings count, what tests count, are there other duties? What, what are people's thoughts? Let's start with the what meetings count. This is, this is Kelly. I feel like I'm stating the obvious, but just to say it out loud, any of the official MAC meetings and subcommittee meetings would certainly count as um, duties of a member. I agree with that as well. And thank you for pointing out the obvious since, um, thank you, <laughs> one of us had to do it. So thank you. So yes, these official meetings that I believe happen eight times a year, if I am, uh, um, Sarah is nodding as well as subcommittee meetings. And Sarah, to clarify, since I'm not on a subcommittee, are the subcommittee meetings official meetings or are they more ad hoc? How is that? Yeah, I mean, we would, yes, we would consider 
I, I mean, I think I would consider any subcommittee meeting if we if we um, have empowered a subcommittee and we have members of a subcommittee, um, that is an official MAC duty, and I would I would put that under official duties. Of the MAC. I also agree. Does anyone disagree with these two categories of meetings, both these official approximately monthly meetings that are public and the subcommittee, formal subcommittee meetings? Does anybody have a reason that that would not be considered an official duty? And please feel Carolyn, free. This, this is Lisa. I'm chair of the eighth subcommittee. So we meet every month um, on a regular basis. So that, I mean, that's obviously an official meeting. Um, the other thing I would uh, suggest is that we also have a couple of planning meetings every month. Um, we have a co-chairs meeting for the MAC and, and ACE subcommittees that Sarah and Tom also attend. Um, and occasionally there are also uh, planning meetings that Sarah and I have regarding the subcommittee. So I would put those under a different category than official meetings, but also put them under other tasks, right? Seems reasonable to me. Sarah, are you, um, and if you aren't, would you mind uh, keeping notes of the different types of meetings that we're talking about? So we have the official meetings, the subcommittee meetings. It sounds like we also have planning meetings. Are there other meetings that members of the MAC are participating in that I am not aware of? So the only... The only other piece I can think of is that we sometimes have educational sessions that we consider to be, um, that we sponsor and we consider to be um, uh, um, not tentative, optional, right? So that's, that's one piece. And then there are educational meetings that we tell you about for other committees or whatever, because we think they might be of interest to you, but that aren't necessarily um, MAC related, right? And and so I would I would suggest that folks coming to optional MAC sponsored meetings, that's an official MAC duty. But if we're telling you about a meeting um, that isn't a MAC sponsored meeting, that that wouldn't count. What are people's thoughts about that proposal? I would agree with that. One of the things that came to mind for me is you all sponsored an opportunity for folks to come together to do some of the mandated training. Um, so for me, that fits both in the meeting. It also probably fits in the other tasks um, in terms of completing required training. Yes, I had on my list to bring up those lovely trainings with the incredible online platform <laughs> that we all struggle with. So I, I would agree. I would put that under other tasks. I also agree with Sarah do about the differentiation there of the optional meetings. Do other, are there other thoughts about that, those statements, agreements or disagreements in general? Laura. Yes, thank you. I was just thinking, you know, we, we we have the educational sessions as well for the healthcare workforce committee, and we try and sometimes use the term official business. Um, so I was we we just had one where we reviewed the charter. So that was an hour meeting, and we considered that official business. I don't, I'm not sure how um, how you determine. Um, what's going to what's going to be official business and what isn't. Um, but I would think that a meeting like Sarah's talking about where you're just, you know, this is informational, you might want to um, attend this, you might get something out of it. I wouldn't think that would be a meeting that you would get reimbursed for. Am I off base? Do you think? I'm not sure. Like, but the charter meeting, we did, we would, you know, we, because we did official business, I guess. And I think you are summarizing perfectly Sarah's proposal that Kelly and myself also think is reasonable that if it's a optional meeting sponsored by the MAC 
that would count as official business if it is the MAC informing us of interesting opportunities that are not sponsored by the MAC, that would be our own interest pursuing that opportunity and would not count for uh, compensation. Other thoughts on that, the, that piece of meetings? Other types of meetings, again, throw that question out there again. Are there other meetings that are happening that people are participating in? Sarah, are there meetings of uh, individual MAC members talking with members of OHA or legislators or any of those kinds of meetings? Does that happen? Um, that's a good question. I do offer one-on-ones, and mm -hmm. so I think if folks are taking me up on that offer, um, we would consider that an official duty. Um, I, I'm not aware of a, a lot of crosstalk amongst, um, MAC members, um, and certainly if they if there were more than a quorum, well, we would have to make that a public meeting. So, um, so I, you know, I don't, um, all of the meetings that I'm aware of are subcommittee meetings. Um, yeah. I'm just thinking if somebody say wanted to reach out to one of our presenters and have a meeting and they spent an hour becoming more informed on the subject, would that be an official meeting? Would that be their own interest. I think that's a question to throw back to you as members. Yeah. I mean, one thing to consider is whether that person's doing that at the charge of the MAC or whether they're doing that for their own edification. What are people's thoughts about the kind of meeting if we are meeting separately with a presenter to learn more, either at our own interest or at the charge of the MAC? What are people's thoughts? So would this be a meeting that other members of the MAC would be available, would be invited to attend? Or is this just somebody asking a staff member for more information about a topic? I think we are in the hypothetical world and so potentially both. Just trying to generate discussion of what other meetings might come up, what things, what possibilities do we need to think about? I mean, to me, I would count those because it is Matt member board work versus going to maybe an OHA town hall or something about about one of their policies right it's it's and as long as it's specific to mac board member duties i would think that would count other opinions can i ask a clarifying question for lisa of course um lisa do, if if um when you say MAC duties, um, if the MAC, if you hear something about an, a topic that interests you in the MAC and you reach out to a, a staff member to learn more about it, um, but it's not at the charge of the MAC, like you're not researching something to report back to the MAC to, does that make a difference for you or does it still feel like that is a, an official duty? I would say if you're just requesting additional information from a staff member regarding something you heard in MAC, that that would be personal education versus preparing for a presentation or preparing for an upcoming vote, like getting more detail about a topic that is going to be MAC meeting business. So, I mean, I guess that's my nexus there is, is it going to be part of a MAC meeting? Um, and are you preparing for that MAC meeting or are you just becoming more informed on a topic that you want more information about? 
I think that's a fantastic differentiation, Lisa, and I think pairs well with Sarah's similar but different words of, is it at the charge of the MAC versus individual interest? So is it at the charge of the MAC? Is it going to be presented in, to the MAC officially or summarized in an email officially? Then that would qualify versus um, individual education. Carissa has asked, what if the member needs additional education and information to more effectively serve on the MAC and or subcommittees? Uh, where is equity in this conversation? Um, one thought I have about if additional education is needed, that might be through the one-on-ones with Sarah that much of that information could be learned from there, which we have talked about being considered as official duties. And can you speak more to your question about equity? Hi, yeah, I think just um, considering that, you know, Everybody has different needs, a different awareness. You don't know what you don't know. Um, and being more supportive of, you know, if someone's seeking additional information or education around topics that are covered in the MAC meetings, especially when it comes to things that are going to be voted on, um, that it would be considered more in relation to their ability to effectively serve on the committee and be considered an official duty rather than um, being considered as someone just wanting personal education about it. Because, I mean, obviously, if it's related to the MAC or subcommittee work, I mean, sure, maybe they have an interest in it personally, but clearly it would help them serve more effectively and make better decisions. Thank you. Would, what would your thought be about having that additional education be with a one-on-one -on -one with Sarah as that being a format of education and be con being considered an official duty as part of her one-on-ones that she offers? Um, personally, I mean, I think that's great that Sarah's offering that and that that's considered, you know, official duty, but I think um, leaving it up to the person to decide, I feel like is something that I would be more behind. Um, I mean, Sarah probably knows a lot and that's great, but having the ability to speak to someone who, you know, not to say Sarah would do this, but perhaps she filters things or whatever it is, or she might have her biases. I think being able to seek information directly from the source should be available and should be supported. Thank you. What are other opinions about Carissa's thoughts? Do other people have ideas or thoughts about that point of view? I appreciate that, um, those thoughts. I think um, in order to ensure or attempt to ensure consistency um, for how it gets applied, it seems like even if Sarah is not the one providing the education and information that, that me as a MAC member in my 101s with Sarah would say, I need to learn more about X and she would help facilitate that official learning for me as a MAC member. Um, or bring the right folks into that conversation. Instead of Sarah being the only one educating me, she would connect me to those subject matter experts within the context of onboarding or educating me as a MAC member, just to provide, and I'm saying Sarah, but whichever staff person, it makes sense, just to provide some consistency so that there's guidance out to MAC members to understand, for all of us to understand the guardrails around when am I acting in official capacity as a MAC member? What thoughts about Kelly's comment do we have? 
Um, I have, I'm on the Mac. My name is Kaya and I represent uh, the Southern Oregon <clears throat> and the tribes. And I have reached out to Sarah just one-on-one -on -one to say, hey, like, I need to know, um, can you educate me more on this piece? And she's been super quick to assist in that. And then if uh, I had a conversation with her recently, and if it wasn't something that she felt comfortable answering or didn't know the complete answer to, she then directed me to somebody who who did. And so I like, I like to utilize Sarah in w wanting to know official duties and those kind of things and the one-on-ones. Sarah's my go-to for it, for sure. And Kaya, would you have considered those resources that Sarah referred you to as official duties? Maybe. <laughs> Carissa, do you, um, not to put you on the spot, but do you have follow-up thoughts about the idea of the referrals being the source of consistency for additional education? Oh, thanks for asking because I I was hoping uh, Kai would say yes, definitely. Um, but <laughs> yes, definitely. Yeah. <laughs> thanks. Um. So yeah, I think that. Um. But I think also, like with Kai's example, being able to count that time that she uh, met with the people she was referred to should count as well. I think beyond just meeting with Sarah. Other opinions? Sounds like we've talked a lot about meetings. What tasks do people think count outside of our meetings? And we, we already touched on the required trainings that we have to do. Well, this is Lisa. I mean, we are also also talked about the planning meetings for these meetings. So there's there's pre planning that happens around official meetings. So those are probably pretty clearly on the list. Seems reasonable to me. What other tasks are individuals doing as part of their map work that I may not be aware of? I think it's worth discussing, I think you already said this, but worth discussing the prep work and the email reading of materials in anticipation and whether that, um, for some folks that might take more time than the others, how does that factor into it as a task? Thank you for bringing that up. So the document that Sarah, uh, Sarah mes messaged us, this is on um, under... I'm looking for it. Where did that go? The de minimis standard. And it says performing a task for a de minimis amount of time does not qualify for compensation. For example, replying to an agency email to state the member will be attending the next meeting or reading a substantive email for five to 10 minutes ordinarily is de minimis and not eligible for compensation. As Sarah mentioned, if there are ADA accommodations needed, that would be factored in. I do know that it takes more than five to 10 minutes to prep, read the very thorough email that Sarah sends out. I know I spend at least half an hour um, talking with Sarah and then reviewing things additionally on my own to prepare for these meetings. What, um, what, how much time are other people spending on this? I'm not spending a great deal of time on that, but like with these meetings specifically, like I had to, I work in intensive mental health and addiction as a clinician. And, um, I have to request, I have to put in for time off to attend these meetings and, but like emails and stuff like you, I, I do go through and have to dissect like 30 minutes or so just to understand what I'm reading. Um, but that's like neither here nor there. And I wouldn't, I wouldn't expect 
a compensation from that because that's also part of my job is to do the emails and all all those types of things but like for this I have to actually put in um uh, request time off to even attend these meetings and then sometimes like if I have a client who is in crisis or something I have to exit and um I think that's the only piece that uh I not struggle with but just having to request off I have to request off four hours on Wednesdays for these meetings <clears throat> from my job and I don't have OHP or any of those services so like I need like every penny I can get Thank you, Kaya. That is quite the burden. Are you having to take PTO for that time or unpaid hours, if you don't mind? So then I, they're, they're more um, flexible, like I can flex. So then like yesterday, I can work nine and a half. Tomorrow, I can work 10 and just to try to do that. But other words, then I'm just using my, my PTO yeah, to cover that. That is a big additional amount of work. And thank you for doing that. I... um. I know most people are not given specific time to, from their jobs to do this. So we appreciate everybody's efforts. I did, um, I do have a question for Sarah about the compensation. Is it, is the compensation based on an hourly rate, a day rate? How is the compensation provided? Yeah, so that is a per diem. It's, it's a daily rate. Um, and it is, um, that's part of the sticking point, right? Um, and I will drop the full paragraph regarding, get a whole paragraph in the desk, uh, guidance regarding what official duties is. Um, and um, I'll just drop that in the chat. It might be helpful for folks, but I, um, uh, right, I think, one of the, that's part of the issue is that in passing the legislation, they didn't want to put an hourly piece. They, uh, for whatever reason, tying it to this, um, the compensation that the legislature receives seem like a, a good mechanism. And since it's a per diem, they, didn't put any parameters around how much time, especially knowing that various committees have different amounts of time for their meetings and, and that kind of thing. So <clears throat> DAS has interpreted essentially in writing this guidance um, that the intent was to allow for people to do the work while also acknowledging that there are some um, sometimes when a person might on one day look at an email that's related to their um, th their committee, but it, it might not rise to the level of receiving um, compensation for that day. Thank you for that clarification, Sarah. I think an important question then as follow-up for the group to think about is what number of minutes or hours do we think is reasonable to, as a minimum, to count for compensation and knowing that these days we spend multiple hours, other times it might be less what initial thoughts do people have about this? And um, before people answer, I'm thinking we probably should not come to a vote on this today. My thought would be to ask Sarah to summarize what we have talked about and have it as an agenda item at an upcoming and then send that out for people to review and have it as an agenda item to further discuss and hopefully vote on at a future meeting would be my thought. I am open to other thoughts, of course. I see some nods about the vote. Okay, so let's plan on deferring the vote. So back to my question, and I apologize for combining two questions at once. Um, what are people's thoughts about what a reasonable minimum time frame is to qualify for a per diem compensation since it is not an hourly compensation? 
So, Caroline, we talked about this in ACE yesterday. This is Lisa. Um, I, I mean, my personal rule of thumb is at least 30 minutes, right? Like at least a half hour devoted, right? Um, I don't think I've ever actually claimed for anything that short, but that would be my that would be my personal bright line, but I know everybody's got their own. Thank you, Lisa. What other opinions came up in the ACE yesterday if people are willing to share? Sarah, you want to cover that? Because I got I got booted out halfway through for a power failure of this discussion. Yeah, I think we also heard um, that any times that we spend, that a member spends um, doing something that is related, like would I, would I be writing this email if I weren't on this committee? Um, would I be reading this email if I weren't on this committee? That that, um, that is the consideration uh, that we ought to take into account. So not so much a a time, a strict time, um, but maybe more thinking about kind of the mental, emotional labor that it takes um, to address the task. I, I appreciate that perspective. I'm a very linear, concrete person. I like rules and numbers. Uh, so I, but I, de I definitely appreciate that um, thinking about it more from the perspective of a cognitive load, even more than the number of minutes. My thought about that, however, is reflecting back to this uh, official duties recommendation from DAS about their specific language of five or 10 minutes is normally de minimis. And if we are using this as guidance, then I think writing a brief email or reading a email for five or 10 minutes would not qualify. That being said, my understanding is these are guidelines, not rules that we get to decide for what is best for our group. So I would be curious to hear more opinions on the idea of cognitive load versus exact minutes. Yeah, this is Carissa Bishop, if I could speak to that, um, which that was my comment in the ACE meeting yesterday. Um, and I come to this as a Medicaid member, as someone who has a disability, who, um, you know, has lived experience. And I think about other people with other lived experiences and intersecting identities and really thinking about equity um, and who we're talking about, you know, getting this compensation. This is, and even this guide, the guidance that's provided, uh, you know, maybe this is based on legislators, which probably have other sources of income or whatever. Um, I'm just thinking like, what is the goal? Like we want people to be able to participate fully. Um, and I can j just say for myself, like being able to get compensated for my work on committees, which I have yet to be compensated for anything related to the ACE committee, but on other committees I've served on, it has literally helped pay my rent, put food on the table and allowed me to be a contributing you know, citizen and has built me up to the point where I will probably be getting off the Medicaid and off of the compensation that I get for the meetings eventually. Um, and so I think instead of focusing on, I, I mean, I get it when you're thinking of someone who works full time, oh, they're reading an email on their day off or whatever, like that's, but we're talking about people who, for at least myself, I didn't have any other compensation. This is very much needed. And when I'm putting my energy towards it um, and my cognitive load, whether it is five or 10 minutes, I think that should be counted. Thank you, Carissa, for opening up and sharing that. I think that is a very important side of this that we need to think about. Well, we are um, at 1030. Are there any final thoughts before we pause, take a break, and ask Sarah to summarize this conversation? I appreciate everybody's input into this. 
I think it's a complex issue and I think we're, we've had some good discussion and um, different perspectives today that open some of our minds to things we might not have thought about. So I think we have a good base for more discussion and a vote. Um, any last thoughts before we take a break? Okay, well again, thank you everyone for sharing your opinions on this. It is hard to share opinions um, about finances frequently in a group. So I appreciate everybody uh, being willing to talk about this together. So it is 1030, we will take a 10 minute break. Uh, we will return at 1040. And at that point, Kelly will be taking over as the interim leader. Thank you for bearing with me as I uh, did this this morning. I am, it's not my usual. So thank you for bearing with me and see you all in 10 minutes.
I'm going to start welcoming folks back. Um, it's 1041. If you could just, if you've had your script camera on, turn that on so we know you're back or just give a thumbs up. That would help us know that we've got the group reconvened. Thanks, saw lots of hands on the screen. Um, welcome back um, for folks who may have missed at the beginning. My name is Kelly DeVore. I am a MAC member um, and I'm gonna take us through the rest of the agenda. Next um, on the agenda is related to the 1115 Medicaid waiver. Um, Megan Auclair, budget and fiscal manager with OHA's director's office. Um, I, I believe is with us. Yes, I see you on my screen yeah. um, to present a plan and process for health related social needs or HRSN um, listening sessions. We'll talk about some potential needs and barriers that members might face when applying for HRSN services um, and have a chance for some questions and comments from the committee. So Megan, are you ready to go? I am. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Well, good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for having me here today. My name is Megan O'Claire. I use she, her pronouns, and I am the project director for the 1115 Waiver Implementation Project. Uh, I will be here to chat a little bit about um, our approach for hearing from members and community partners on their experience uh, and some of the tools that we've developed uh, for services that were approved in our most recent waiver. Let's go ahead and switch to the next slide. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so I'll give just a quick primer. I know a lot of this information is going to be uh, familiar to all of you, uh, given your participation on the committee uh, and your familiarity. But uh, when we talk about the waiver, what we mean is really uh, the way that we are negotiating uh, our particular details of how Medicaid works in Oregon. So you're all familiar with the Oregon Health Plan. Uh, it's our uh, it's our version of Medicaid, which is the public health insurance program for families uh, based on uh, age, uh, income, and other criteria. Uh, and we go through a process every five years to renegotiate with the federal government what that program looks like in Oregon. So next slide, please. There are some standard rules for how Medicaid works across the country. And uh, through this five-year process, we essentially ask the federal government for some permission to do things a little bit differently. So this can be anything from how our providers are paid, how our services are paid, what services are covered. And we go through a process where we negotiate that agreement with the federal government. And then once we reach an agreement, we have to put into place those new program changes and in some cases, entirely new programs uh, for our OHP members. Uh, next slide, please. So in our most recent waiver negotiation, we did receive approval in Oregon for something called health-related social needs. So uh, services that are designed to support uh, housing, the uh, areas of health that are not directly related to receiving medical services, but that we know are just as important to uh, ensuring good health and well-being. So what we received approval for uh, was the ability to pay for certain services like uh, access to healthy foods, uh, some housing supports, including rental assistance, uh, climate support devices for uh, folks who, you know, for example, live in an area that's affected by wildfire smoke, uh, where that is uh, going to impact their health, we are able to pay for things like air filters, air conditioners, um, and then some services related to uh, outreach to members to make sure that they can be connected to these services. So these are new services that we've not previously been able to cover. And anytime we uh, have a new service or a new benefit that we offer, we know that means that there's going to be new challenges, new steps that a member uh, has to take, new things that providers need to do in order to make sure that those services are accessible. Next slide, please. So as the team has been working through uh, these new services and the new benefits, uh, knowing that sometimes those can be really difficult to navigate and that you know, the new activities are, are not easy, uh, always easy to access, what we did through the project was created something that we're calling the member journey tool. Um, the purpose of this tool was really to describe uh, to staff, to partners, to providers, what the experience of a member is likely to be uh, as they are accessing these services. So uh, as part of that negotiation with CMS, they do, uh, they do tell us that certain things have to be in place. So certain activities around data sharing or approvals uh, or how a person would apply for these services. And so uh, our goal here is really to take those 
things that we know we have to do because the federal government tells us uh, and what the operations of our partners and providers look like and really try to paint the picture for, for people, what you can experience, what are you asked to do, what can you benefit from, uh, and try to give them information to uh, help support and empower them to really uh, access the benefits and access the services that they uh, have a right to access. And so what we've done with these tools is really uh, created that picture, uh, including some journey maps that really try to illustrate what a person can expect to experience, actions they can take, resources they can use. These are digital tools, so they're intended to uh, really be easily navigated by, by people. You can zoom in on them. Uh, we have some features in there where uh, you know you can kind of click through the information whatever uh, in whatever way makes the most sense however you best learn or want to uh, seek out the information and these tools are available online in english and spanish and so this is actually the tool and some of the process that we're seeking feedback from members and from community partners uh, in the coming weeks next slide please so now that we have this tool, we really wanted to do some focused engagement with members and the people who support members and hear from them directly. So this is an example of the English version of our member journey tool. Each tool is about 15 pages uh, or so. Uh, they are digital tools, as I mentioned, so they're designed to help uh, allow you to navigate through the information uh, really in whatever way you prefer. Um, and it really walks a person through the steps. So step one, Here's some options. Here's the way that you can begin uh, to, you know, inquire uh, with your provider or with a partner or with a trusted part, a community partner uh, about whether you might be eligible for these services. So these are really written from the perspective of the member. So it's using very first person language. Uh, here's how I can uh, access this. Here's how I can talk to my provider. Um, here's what I will need to do and here's what they will do. So we've tried to make the language very accessible. Uh, and want to thank a lot of our internal uh, partners from multiple agencies who helped us get to a more plain language version of this. Um, but again, this really walks a person through really a five-step process of how to learn about your options, how to complete the screening process, uh, what will happen when you are awaiting a decision from your CCO or from uh, your fee-for-service care coordination coordinator, how you will go about uh, getting those services, uh, and then how to use those services and get help if you're running into any roadblocks. So there are a lot of resources available um, in these tools. Uh, next slide, please. And we've also transcreated them into Spanish. So uh, I do wanna be clear that these are not translated into Spanish, they were transcreated. So the language is gonna look a little bit different given that it's not a one-for-one -one translation. Um, so we've tried to uh, make sure that this information is accessible to a lot of our community partners uh, and folks who support members uh, who are Spanish speaking. Uh, and again, we're looking to collect uh, really input and feedback on whether this information is helpful, whether it's useful, what else uh, are we missing about the process or the experience of the member in trying to access services uh, and really help inform uh, some of the, the future versions of our HRSN services that will go live later this year. So. We have one, uh, one benefit in the climate category that's available. Our housing benefit will go live in November and the nutrition will go live in January. So we have a little bit of time between now and the next service to hear from people about what their experience is or where we can make some improvements. I do just wanna say again, we, we have some constraints here. So we will probably get some feedback on parts of this process that we, we really can't change because of the expectations from our federal partners but we do still wanna understand where could this be simpler? Where could this be easier for members uh, and for people who support members in this, in this experience? Next slide, please. So I wanted to share a little bit of information about how we're going to go about uh, this process. So we are partnering uh, with uh, an organization called the Metropolitan Group. We worked with them during uh, the public health emergency unwinding as we were developing materials for uh, the Keep Cover campaign uh, on, on this aspect of the project. So what we're hoping to do here, again, is get some very focused input from members directly and from people and providers who support members. So the, the purpose here is we want to gain insights into the potential needs or obstacles that are faced by OHP members as they're accessing benefits. We also wanna test the language and the materials that are related to that member journey, make sure that the information is clear, that it's useful, 
uh, if there are things that we have missed that we are not, you know, including in the document that would be really helpful for people to know, we want to make changes to the next version that will include that information. So the approach that we're taking here is uh, we will have 10 in-person listening sessions with OHP members. Five will be in English and five will be in Spanish. These will be uh, hosted by a community-based organization. So uh, the, they'll be facilitated by our partners uh, at the Metropolitan Group, but will be hosted by a local organization. Uh, and the Be Metropolitan Group has been reaching out to uh, organizations that have been active in some of our webinars, who have been participating in our work sessions as we're building out the program design for these services. So we're hoping that we can help make some connections there between members, some of the providers who might not have been part of the Medicaid system previously, and help familiarize people with the information and with the process here. So they will be also hosting five virtual sessions uh, with providers. We felt that it was very important to be uh, hands-on and in-person with members, and uh, that providers in some cases preferred the ability to do virtual listening sessions. We'll also be holding one of those in Spanish. So we're hoping to hear from a broader array of folks who uh, participate in this, in this process in, in some form. The format will be 90 minute sessions. Again, we're asking for input on uh, any, anything about this process that you know, maybe doesn't make as much sense that we could offer more clarity on, where we made some assumptions maybe about the member's experience that don't match what people's experience really, really is or is really likely to be. We also wanna hear that. Um, and so this will be happening over the course of the next uh, couple of weeks. Let me, uh, let's have us click to the next slide, please. Uh, so as I mentioned before, these listening sessions are gonna be hosted by local community-based organizations. Uh, we were looking for folks who provide assistance to OHP members in ac accessing health services uh, for folks who serve both English and Spanish speaking community members. We did have some constraints uh, in you know, trying to do this in, in multiple languages, but we made a decision that English and Spanish speaking uh, would kind of get, get a little bit better, a, a little broader of a, of a, a sample of you know, who, who's involved in our, our process here. Um, we wanted to make sure that these were organizations who worked with populations who were likely to be impacted by these services. So not everyone who receives OHP or who is a, an OHP member uh, will be eligible for HR Send services. So we wanted to make sure that we're talking to folks who are likely to engage in this process, who are likely to be eligible for these services uh, and can see themselves in, in the, you know, the example and the member journey that we've created here. We are looking to do this across all the key regions in the state. So uh, the Portland Metro, Willamette Valley, uh, the coast, Central Oregon, Eastern Oregon, and Southern Oregon. So we've tried to make sure that we've got representation from urban areas, from rural areas, uh, and areas that have been affected by wildfire smoke, you know, specific examples where we know these services will be in, in higher demand, and make sure that we, we hear perspectives from all across the state. We are also able to compensate uh, folks for, for hosting, for recruiting, and for participating in this, uh, in this engagement. Um, I know it's been uh, not an easy thing for the state to pivot to that, but we're you know, very well aware that we are asking people to dedicate time and to provide their expertise, and that should be compensated. It is extremely valuable time and valuable information, and so we're happy to be able to compensate both organizations for helping us host and recruit and for the participants for helping to provide feedback on the content. Uh, next slide, please. So that is phase one. Uh, phase one, we're really focusing on the members and the member journey. Uh, phase two is what we're in the process of planning right now. So we are also looking to hear from providers about the experience in enrolling as a Medicaid provider. I mentioned earlier that we are talking to folks and talking to providers who have maybe not previously been part of the Medicaid system, and it can be fairly intimidating, and the process is not always easy to become a provider uh, you know, that is able to get reimbursed by Medicaid. So uh, part one, we want to hear from members and people who support members. And part two, we really want to hear from providers about their experience getting enrolled. Um, again, we know that there are some federal expectations that we're not going to be able to change in terms of the information we're asking for, but there may be some spaces in how we're asking for that information that we can make some improvements in our forms or in our, uh, you know, how people can can submit the right information to us so that they can uh, enroll fairly easily. 
This is not going to begin until May, um, and this is a little bit more focused on this virtual lis listening sessions with providers who are considering being part of uh, the HRSN service network. So uh, folks who may not be a Medicaid provider currently, but may be interested because they are a housing provider or they offer uh, you know, nutrition benefits in some way, and they'd like to uh, be, become part of the, the Medicaid system in order to, to offer these services to members. So this will be a very similar format. 90 minute sessions that will be facilitated by the Metropolitan Group. We're looking to have uh, you know, multiple sessions that are based on really the size of the organizations uh, and looking to accommodate smaller and culturally specific and emerging organizations. So trying to be very mindful there that we don't have sort of a large group of people that will be dominated by maybe the most powerful voices in the room. We want to create some spaces where we can have more, more intimate conversations about how their experience has been or is likely to be uh, so that we can really hear from everyone about, about what we might be able to make better. So this will begin in May. Uh, and as a result of both phase one and phase two, what we will get back is a summary report of what those recommendations might be. So any feedback that we've heard on more valuable information uh, on where this process might not match what people's experience actually looks like. Um, we will have that uh, returned to us in the next couple of months. And then as a project team and as a leadership team, we will need to take a look at those recommendations and see what we can put in place for uh, our next go live in November. So again, there are things that are easily within our control to, to make changes to. We obviously can uh, make a lot of changes to the information that we put out there and uh, you know the, the tools that we produce that can make this a little easier to, to navigate. Some of the changes in terms of the process, we may be constrained by how the expectations from our federal partners uh, come to us. So we're not sure yet how much of the recommendations we'll be able to, uh, to actually implement, but really looking forward to hearing from everyone about our assumptions, uh, you know, how this, how this might work in practice and, and looking forward to hearing people who are a little closer to the experience than we are. So with that, I think we can move into some time for questions and answers if folks have any. Thanks, Megan. Um, yeah, it looks like we have about 12 minutes. Um, I will not be the one that puts us behind. Um, Lisa's got her hand up. Go ahead, Lisa. Yeah, I was just going to say, we did this a similar presentation yesterday at the ACE meeting, and one of the questions we had for OHA is what sort of um, outreach they're requesting that the CCOs do about these benefits, because I actually pulled up my own CCOs website during the meeting yesterday and there was absolutely nothing on there about any of this um the member handbook when i pulled that up it had been revised in january and it had one paragraph on page 58 about these services so this is why um you know caroline just put the note in the comments about people not knowing about these and i'm wondering what oha is planning to do to get the CCOs on board with actually doing some outreach to members because several of us in there have various CC and the ACE committee have various CCOs and none of us have heard anything from our CCO about any of this. So the question is about what what expectations we have for CCOs to do outreach on HRSN services in particular. Uh, yes, correct about the new the new funds that are available. Yeah, so let me um, let me check back with the team on any expectations that we've set for CCOs. I think typically um, we have relied on you know relied on CCOs to uh, to be that that bridge between members and their service their services obviously, but I'm not sure if we have put expectations out there for them to do be doing proactive outreach um, uh, you know in contract. I know we have uh, asked them to. Uh, publish information related to uh, community capacity building funds, for example. So where we've got some funding available for providers who are looking to become part of the HRSN service network, uh, that should be available online. Well, let me double check with the team on uh, where we've set expectations for them in terms of advertising um, or reaching out to members directly on, on the services themselves. Thanks, Tony. I, if you want to go ahead, I, I can also respond to that as someone who works with a CCO, but Tony, you had your hand up first. Do you want to go ahead and jump on that? I think that would be helpful. Part of my question surrounds some of that. Sure. I'll just say for our organization, I work with Pacific Source. Um, part of the challenge is and continues to be that the, the benefits aren't live yet. And so that may be why you're not finding anything. So we're doing 
work within our communities to do outreach to prospective service providers of HRSN um, benefits to try to align and create the network of the services that will be provided. A component of that work will be outreach and engagement to prospective members who may be eligible based on the criteria for each of the benefits. Um, but it, aside from the climate supports, um, housing and nutrition services are not live yet. Therefore, there's no network. So there's not really anything to apply for at this point. So I suspect that more will be pushed out in the coming months as that becomes clearer and those pieces fall together. As Megan mentioned, Part of the work being done right now with the CCOs in partnership with OHA is to um, make some funds available for prospective service providers to build their capacity to become um, <clears throat> HRSN service providers. And then I saw in the chat um, similar, um, there have been presentations to our CACs as well. So starting to do that outreach to our CACs to advise us on how best to educate and inform, member and inform members. So the, the climate benefit is live. So it's been live for over a month now, six weeks. And I don't think that relying on uh, providers to get this information out is going to work because as we recently saw, I mean, basically they get 15 minutes with, with patients on average and they do not have time to both deal with a member's medical needs and you know, do their, their, uh, all the, the surveys that have to be done, um, you know, and the real D's and all these things and cover these benefits. So I think you're going to have to ask the CCOs to do some member outreach. Um, because otherwise I don't think it's going to happen. And as far as I've seen, none of that is actually happening yet. And the, these, like I said, these climate benefits have been live for six weeks or more now. Thanks, Lisa. Tony, do you want to go ahead? Yeah, thanks, Kelly. Thank you for that clarification. I did have a couple questions and a few a comment um, uh, that aligns a little bit with some what's been said already. So not to be redundant. Um, when we're uh, in the presentation, thank you, Claire, for that. Um, when we're referring to provider, uh, I was just curious what that was referring to. Are we referring to community-based organizations as the provider of this care? Are we referring to medical providers? Are we referring to community health workers? I think that's a bit of the clarity that I think some of these questions are arising is who is best equipped to accomplish the goal of getting these tools to our community members? Uh, and that's a question I have. And, and I think Ms. Pearson's comment to the effect that the, the limitations of, of what um, uh, in the clinical healthcare setting as primary care and, and to um, uh, Caroline uh, Barrett's uh, point, um, there are limits. I, I think one of the, the best tools and just reflection is that in a clinical setting, we're able to screen, we're able to um, uh, understand the risk factors that uh, our, our patients see. So if we have a patient with COBD or asthma, we're aware of some of those screening tools as far as being houseless, um, uh, that we can um, uh, you know, make aware, but it is that connection um, uh, to the services. And I would just, for instance, in my community health centers, I would say that FQHCs are gonna be very well equipped. We have some tools, um, but that differs between some of those um, in our ability to, to connect that person. So really, I think that probably where we're going to get the biggest bang for a buck is connected with community-based organizations that are um, able to identify patients. I would elevate the comment that CCOs, I, I think, are able to um, get that information out. So um, before I go long-winded, the, the question of who are we targeting to get this connection when we say provider? Is that all of the above or was that referring to clinical settings? Great question, thank you. So what we were referring to for the focus groups, at least for this stage, uh, would be community-based organizations. So those HRSN service providers who would be sort of delivering the last mile, right? The, the air conditioner, the air purifier, um, folks who are really in a position to help members navigate a process or a system outside of the medical setting. Um, I, I totally hear you on the, you know, how do we get information to the folks who will be able to make the connection between the clinical criteria and the availability of these supportive services. Um, I do, I, I think right now we've, we've been pushing out a, a decent amount of information 
to the Medicaid provider sphere. Um, I don't know. I don't know though that again, not having the remainder of those services live, if they're going to know what to do with that information right now. So you know, the, the climate benefit launched in in March. It is a pretty limited benefit. Um, we we do also run into the challenge where this is not a thing that is uh, going to be available to every OHP member. Most services are. These have a, another layer of criteria that you have to meet in order to be eligible for them. So I think the balance we're trying to strike is make sure that everyone knows it's available, but don't over, you know, overestimate who can actually, uh, you know, make use of it. So I'm definitely open to, to thoughts on how we how we thread the needle there and, and make sure that the providers are aware that these can be can be an option um, where, you know, previously it's not been a covered benefit. It's been available through flex funds only, but this is a, a little bit more, more solid of a Medicaid benefit for some folks. Yeah, I appreciate that. You know, I think um, we were very excited, I think, with uh, coming back with uh, CMS and a bit more of um, uh, the eligibility restrictions. Uh, those are more tight than I think we were anticipating, unfortunately. I wonder if there is a tool um, that CBOs or providers could reference real quickly just to input, say, if, then, you know, and these criteria for that. Right now, uh, um, you know, something to just plug in to say, um, are you recently incarcerated? Are you recently houseless? Are you at risk of being houseless? Um, those, you know, can be simple check boxes, just like on a website. I don't know if that's something feasible. I know in a quick um, setting, a clinical setting, that's nice. Um, and I wonder, I, I imagine CBOs would find that a value than, than a list, you know, on a, on a page. Um, so maybe some food for thought uh, uh, with that, a development of a tool uh, in, in that context. Um, uh, some of the comments just want to elevate to, to um, through the CCOs, I think it would be really helpful through the CACs, also professional uh, organizations. Um, uh, Caroline uh, called out um, to uh, educating providers like OAFP, OMA, OPS, things like that, OPCA. Thanks, Tony. Are there any other questions for Megan? Great. Thank you, Megan. Thank you for your presentation. Thanks so much for having me. Um, now we're going to transition. The um, ACE committee has been referenced a couple of times in our different conversations, so we're going to transition to a subcommittee update. Um, we're going to turn it over to MAC member and um, ACE subcommittee chair Lisa to update us on the work of the ACE subcommittee, as well as to walk us through a proposed change to their charter. Um, as a subcommittee of the MAC, they require MAC approval for changes for this work. So Lisa, are you ready? Yes, I am, if I can get my microphone un unmuted. So hi, this is Lisa Pearson. I'm chair of the uh, Advancing Consumer Experience Subcommittee of the ACE, um, which is made up of members. And um, we have a couple of OHA staff, um, Sarah and Tom, on the meetings as well. Um, so yesterday we we covered a couple of things that have also been covered here. So the compensation piece, we had a discussion around that. And then we also had the presentation around the health related social needs um, funding yesterday. But the main thing today that we want to cover is the proposed charter changes um, that we the ACE is going to be making in lieu of of doing a full charter change at this point, um, we are going to go ahead and make some interim changes, wait, still waiting for CMS to come up with their final guidelines for the beneficiary advisory group, um, make up and requirements. Um, if any of you weren't here for those discussions, um, CMS is creating a requirement for states to have a beneficiary advisory committee uh, for their state Medicaid agencies. Um, and so since we already have the ACE committee, subcommittee of the MAC, we are aiming to become that that committee uh, to meet the CMS guidelines, but we're still waiting. Uh, we've been waiting for well six or eight months now for CMS to finalize the guidelines around that. So in the meantime, what we need to do is come up with some with some other 
interim changes um, because we don't have good guidelines right now around how our subcommittee members become official members, how they're recruited, how they become official members. And, and also it plays into this compensation piece because they have to be official members in order to qualify for compensation. So we're running up against some other new requirements that are going to require us to more formalize our membership and, and structure before we get to the whole CMS changes. So the background on this is we presented a com kind of complex draft charter back in September. Um, and in November, we decided to delay those changes until we see the final CMS rules. So we're not having to go back and amend it again to meet those. The current charter language, as I said, it's really vague concerning how our subcommittee members are chosen and you know who is an official member. So our goal is to come up with a simple process uh, for naming members until CMS finalizes the rules. So the existing language uh, states that the subcommittee includes OHP consumers and, or, and that includes enrollees and caregivers of OHP members uh, and advocates who work with OHP consumers and MAC members. So it says right now that I will, as the chair, will work with the MAC to select subcommittee members for a term of 12 months and at least 51% of the subcommittee members must be OHP consumers. Um, and then I also have, right now have the right to invite ad hoc participants who aren't formal members to attend uh, subcommittee meetings. And it says as need arises, but basically it's been on the interest of outside people to find out what the ACE does and come to meetings, right? So on the next page, our proposed language to, for this change it keeps the first paragraph uh, that says uh, we include OHP consumers and advocates and and MAC members, right? Um, we may down the road have to change that about the advocates because initially CMS had indicated that those would not be part of the beneficiary advisory group, but we don't know yet whether advocates are going to be added to the CMS language or not. So we're leaving that paragraph the way it is and then instead of the, the line that states that I have the right to invite ad hoc participants, we're going to make these public meetings. So any member of the public can attend an ACE subcommittee meeting without me having to personally invite them, which never really made sense to me anyway. So on the next page, our proposed new membership language, our process would be that individuals interested in joining the subcommittee will fill out and submit an application for members. And we in the ACE have reviewed a, 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 a proposed application uh, that we would be using, and it's not very complex. Uh, subcommittee members uh, will review those applications and vote on new members at subcommittee meetings. So that would be a change from the MAC designating membership. The subcommittee itself would, would vote on our membership. And then membership would begin immediately following the vote, at which time the applicant is accepted as an official new member. And then it says we will revisit this process on finalization of the CMS rules. Um, that's really the only changes that we are proposing right now. Um, and the main thing is we have to get in line with who is an official member um, for the for compensation. That's the real driver for doing this change before CMS comes out with their final rules. Um, then we can go back and expand whatever charter requirements we have to have or changes um, th to meet CMS. But right now we have to we have to formalize membership. And so the main change I guess would be that instead of MAC appointing members to the ACE, we would vote on our own membership and also the change and of making it a public meeting that anybody can can attend. Anybody have any questions on that? Sarah, do you have anything to add on that? I just want to point out there's a, my mistake, um, a typo in the slide. Um, so uh, in the second bullet, it says um, there's two references to subcommittee members. The second reference should be subcommittee meetings. We'll fix that in the charter when it's finalized, but I just wanted to be transparent about that. Thank you, Sarah, for calling. I'm sure none of us maybe would have caught that, but thank you for calling. <laughs>
I have a question that maybe is related to this, but maybe it's a bigger question and I've missed it somewhere. When we say OHP members, is that inclusive inclusive of HOP members? Are we using OHP as a general term? That's our intention. Okay. Thanks. Are there other questions for Lisa? Uh, so, does the group? Oh, go ahead, Lisa. Sorry, I think I think we're be, we're asking to have a vote on this today, um, mm -hmm. right, Sarah? We're asking the the MAC to vote on this change today. That's correct. Yep, that was going to be my next question. If there weren't any additional questions, um, is there a motion to accept the change to the subcommittee charger that charter that Lisa has proposed in the presentation? So Sarah, do we need to take a, a, a formal voice vote on this? Yeah, so we do need a motion. We need somebody, a member to make a motion and and someone to second. Hi, this is Ronnie. I motion to move uh, in favor of this change. Thanks, Ronnie. Do we have a second? Hi, this is Jerry. I'll second. Thanks, Jerry. Are there any objections? Any abstentions? Oh, I guess I have to call for a vote. Sorry. Um, can I get a vote on the motion, please? You can either voice or raise your hand. Great. I'm, I'm guessing by all the hands waving, um, it appears to have um, passed. Are there any abstentions that we need to note? Okay, great. Thank you, Lisa. Th thank you, everybody. We are a little ahead of schedule, but we're at the point in the agenda where we would move to public testimony. So I'll just read a little overview, and then I understand that we do have two folks who have asked for the opportunity to make public comment. Um, the Medicaid Advisory Committee welcomes and deeply appreciates public testimony. It is one of the most powerful ways we demonstrate our commitment to profound listening and learning. Deep listening means that we will not respond to what you share, nor will we attempt to fix or resolve the question or concern that you bring today. We will also not interject, interject to correct inaccurate comments that are shared as fact. We will, however, bring it fully into our awareness, understand it as an important consideration of our work, and listen with careful attention, respect, and honor that you deserve. We want to acknowledge that time held in our meetings to hear public testimony is meant to provide a voice and perspective from that individual, and it is not a representation of the Medicaid Advisory Committee, its members, the Oregon Health Authority, or the Oregon Department of Human Services. Each presenter is given two minutes to share. Um, in the event that doesn't feel like enough time, we encourage you to provide written testimony, which we commit to reading. To help us keep on time, there will be a two-minute timer for each commenter. We kindly ask that commenters conclude their presentation when the timer is complete. Please know that written and verbal public comments will be reviewed and discussed following each meeting by the board chairs and staff to determine the appropriate next steps. Um, board staff will communicate the next steps with each public commenter. In addition, please know that we will share any public test or any testimony regarding the 1115 waiver with the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services in OHA's quarterly report to that federal agency. So at this time, I understand that Tom Sinek and Ray Wallace have both requested to be able to speak um, just because this is how it was listed first for me, I'm going to ask Tom to go first. Oh, and Tom, we can't quite hear you. Nope, I can I can see your mouth moving, but not hearing a voice.
Um, let's see, why don't, Tom, why don't we give you a minute to look through your system? If you could restart the timer and I'll ask Ray if he would go ahead and go. Hello, yeah, I can go now. Um, my name is Ray Wallace. I use they, she pronouns, and I'm providing testimony today as a constituent. I've lived in Oregon for a majority of my life, and in 2021, I moved out to Colorado to work in the clinics at Planned Parenthood. Um, I was getting close to turning 26, which meant I was going to be kicked off of my mom's health insurance. Um, I have had disability since I was 16 years old due to a traumatic brain injury. Um, and unfortunately, that was before much research had been done on brain injuries. So the medical advice I was given was now considered bad. <laughs> and um, I found myself dismissed very often by doctors. Um, in 2021, I actually ended up being diagnosed with chronic PTSD due to decade a decade of medical gaslighting. Um, I'm here to advocate for better health coverage for people with disabilities. Um, in Colorado, I was able to make upwards, technically, I didn't make this much money, but I could have made up to $10,000 a month and still qualified for Medicaid, which meant I was no longer foregoing um, credit card debt to pay for my expenses. Um, I wasn't foregoing health care because I couldn't afford health care. Um, I actually had to move back to Oregon due to further health issues. Initially, I thought it was the elevation, but it actually was celiac disease, um, which I also had labs showing that that was an issue that just also was dismissed quite often. Um, but yeah, I basically have had a really hard time maneuvering the healthcare system. I, when I moved back to Oregon, made like a couple hundred dollars over what was needed to afford or to qualify for OHP. At one point, I had to leave my job because I was working in a bakery with celiac disease, and um, I could no longer, basically, I, I no longer qualify. I didn't qualify for OHP. At a point, I did. My expenses used to be $110 a month for Kaiser Premium, and after this like small contract where I was making a couple thousand dollars a month, I lost my OHP, and also my premium tripled. Um, so I'm now at a point where I'm spending $700 to $1,000 a month on my healthcare expenses. Um, is my time up? Sorry, I can't see. Oh, it's close. But yes, basically, I can't afford healthcare. And it would be really cool for us to look at the programs in Colorado that are allowing them to make um, health insurance a lot more affordable for disabled people. Um, and yeah, thank you. Thanks, Ray. Tom, do you want to give it another try? Still can't hear you. Okay, I'd encourage you if you want to reach out and um, maybe submit some written public comment, that would be great. Thank you. Is there anyone else um, present who would like to share some public comment? Okay, I'm not seeing anyone. So I think now um, I'm going to turn it back over to Sarah, I think. Great. Um, and I'm going to, I'm going to um, kind of sit here for another minute since we have it on our schedule as starting at, at 125 for public testimony. I'm going to kind of just do one more call out at, uh, I, I said 125, but of course meant 1125. Um, one more call out now to see if there's any public testimony, just to be sure there wasn't somebody who was coming right at the time um, to share public testimony with us. Okay, so hearing none, um, I'm going to review briefly the discussion. We're, we're in our member discussion panel now or time period now. And I want to review the discussion that we had in January about creating a subcommittee to make recommendations to the MAC regarding the six month and yearly ombuds report. Um, <clears throat> and I'm going to ask for a little help from Jordan. I don't remember if I put the refresher slides in here. 
If not, I can just go over this um, as discussion. Um, but uh, if there is a slide, just go ahead and, and go to that slide. And if there isn't, I'll just keep going. So as you may recall, um, we propose giving the MAC a more active role in reviewing the Ombuds report. And in particular, the Ombuds team submits a more comprehensive six month and yearly report to OHA, which the agency responds to as it does to audits, right? So we wanna use this as an opportunity for the subcommittee of MAC members to review those reports in detail and then return to the MAC with recommendations for continued engagement with the agency around areas the Ombuds team has identified for agency action. So I hope that makes sense. I'm happy to take questions about that. Um, the subcommittee would include both the OHA and ODHS representatives to the MAC and ideally a consumer member and a member who is part of a healthcare organization. And we anticipate that they would meet for about an hour between the meeting in which the reports are delivered and the following meeting to discuss their review with the MAC staff. Um, and the MAC staff would work on a recommendation in that time period uh, between, um, and that would be about whatever continued engagement um, folks in the subcommittee identified. Um, and then we'd bring that, the subcommittee would bring that to the next meeting for MAC approval. So with that, I'm gonna go back to Kelly to lead a discussion about what I have presented. Great, thank you. Um, just, are there any questions or comments from MAC members at this time? Okay, so just so I'm clear, Sarah, we are asking for a motion to create the subcommittee. So I'm restating some of the information. And so if someone was willing to make that motion um, for a subcommittee of the MAC to engage with the Ombuds reports as outlined in the discussion we've had. This is Hillary, I'll move to approve. Thanks, Hillary. Do we have a second? Hi, this is Ronnie St. John, I move to second. Thanks, Ronnie. Any objections? Okay, why don't we go ahead and vote by way of raising a, a hand or a thumbs up. Kelly, this is Laura. I'm just gonna go on record as abstaining just because I don't know enough about the program too. Um, Perfect, thanks, Laura, we'll capture that. Thank you. It looks like um, the motion does carry. Are there any other abstentions? Okay, um, so despite needing to pull through for a motion in a second, we now have the harder part of asking if there's any volunteers to um, join this subcommittee. And Sarah, can you maybe speak to the timeline of when we hope this committee to initiate its work and then yeah, we'll thanks. see that it will come together? So we expect the ombuds to have the first report that they would um that falls into it's the end of your report. We expect that to come to us in June. And so in that case, um the subcommittee members would have from June to September, because we don't meet in um, July or August, to review that document and then um, come back in September with a recommendation for the full committee. Um, I anticipate that would require re the members to review the report and then um, have a, about a one hour meeting with staff to bring forth their thoughts about what the um, the MAC should continue to engage the agency on, essentially asking the agency to return to the MAC um, as kind of an accountability piece. Great, thanks. Hillary, I see you have your hand up. 
Um, Sarah and I have already talked about this committee, and I just wanted to say that I am I continue to be interested in in, in being involved with that. Great. I think this sounds like a great program. Great, thank you. Thanks for being the first one to speak up to engage in this. Are there others who would volunteer to join Hillary in this subcommittee? Hi, Kelly, this is Ronnie St. John. I'm happy to volunteer um, as a community member. Um, I am not a physician, but I do work for uh, Central City Concern. Great, thanks, Ronnie. Sarah, um, recognizing we have a handful of members who aren't present today, I trust that they'll be given the opportunity to volunteer themselves as well. Absolutely. Okay. So we'll, we'll reach out again. Great. Um, well, we're at the point in the meeting staff, are there any other last minute announcements we might need to make at this time? I want to just check in about a couple of things. Um, our next meeting is a retreat, so it's a longer meeting. Um, we'll be in Salem. I'm hoping folks can join us in person because um, that, you know, it's always it's a really good opportunity for us to get to know each other better and really um, work together. Um, and I <clears throat> um want to remind folks that um, tra travel reimbursement is available. Unfortunately, we can't put up the funds for travel, but we can help with um, putting um, w w for folks who need, who are traveling from far away, we can help with um, airline reservations if that's an issue or train reservation uh, through our travel agent and that would get paid for directly um but there you know there anyway we can help with logistics and we're happy to work with you on that um i also want to um be sure folks know because this may not be on everyone's radar um we are planning to have a meeting in um june in albany so we're trying to get to different places around the state um, so that we can potentially highlight things going on in different areas of the state, as well as um, build public interest in the work we're doing and give opportunities for local voices to um, come to the MAC. So, um, I think those are all of the announcements. Uh, one other kind of related announcement, I do wanna make sure that people have noticed um, one thing that we did with this meeting is ask folks to RSVP um, about whether they were gonna be able to join in person or not. And um, it's totally understandable that it, it is not always easy for people to get to meetings in person. We wanted to set a threshold of, um, three members essentially coming in person before we go completely virtual. Uh, frankly, we just want to be good stewards of taxpayer dollars. And um, if we're not going to, if we don't need to pay for catering, right, we don't want to do that. So um, we'll, that's something that we'll be doing going forward. Um, love to hear from folks about whether you can be there in person or not when you RSVP. Great. Those are, I believe, all the announcements that we have from staff. Great. Thank you, Sarah. Are there any additional um, sort of announcements, questions, or discussion from MAC members? Sarah, maybe you guys can come down to climb the falls one time, too, or at least like Medford. <laughs> maybe not as rural as Klamath or reservation style as Klamath. But <laughs> I second. Yeah. This is Laura. That would be great. We would love to host. <laughs> I would love that. <clears throat> great. Thank you. Well, I think at this time, I'm going to turn the meeting back over to Sarah to close us out. Great. Thanks, everybody. Well, um, and, and thank you, Kelly, especially 
uh, and I don't know if Caroline was able to jump back on. I know she had to leave for a while, but I really appreciate your um, stepping in in the absence of Heather to facilitate this meeting. Um, I threw you into the deep end of the pool at a, at the very last minute, and I appreciate that you swum so elegantly. Um, so... In the spirit of continuous improvement, I would first, I would like to ask both for what went well and what you would change about today's meeting. Um, so first we'll start with what went well. Hi, Sarah, this is Ronnie. I really appreciate the inf more information about the And also um, all of our clients who are going to be able to really get the access they need for air conditioners and such that we always run out of funding for. So I appreciated that information today. The reminders were helpful. Great. You cut out a little bit at the beginning, but I think you were um, appreciating more information about the health-related social needs. Is that right? Yes. Sorry about that. My internet's being wonky. <laughs> Thanks. I think it's helpful to hear, Sarah, the threshold by which you would make adjustments for all virtual or in person. Um, that helps, I think, me to think about planning ahead um, to make sure that we can give you appropriate information to how to stage meetings. So thanks for that information. Great. This is Carissa Bishop. Um... I would just say, and I'm not an official, I guess, MAC member, but being a subcommittee member of the ACE, I think what went really well was the incorporation of um, everybody's voice, including my own in the conversations. Um, it felt very natural and welcoming and I really appreciate it. Great. Anything folks would change about today's meeting? Anything we could do to improve meetings going forward? Okay. Um, thanks so much, everybody. I really appreciate all your time and great conversations today. Uh, we will meet again for our retreat in Salem at the Human Services Building on Wednesday, May 29th at 9 a.m. So I look forward to seeing you then. Thanks so much, everybody. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.